Today's topic is five steps to effective enterprise mail security. Joining us to discuss this topic is our panel of experts. First, we have Mr. Will Plummer. Will is Chief Security Officer at Ray Secure and a 25-year veteran of the U.S. Army and Master EOD Technician. Will, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, everybody. We have Mr. Cody Martin. Cody is Ray Secure's Director of Mail Security. Uh, he was an agent with the U.S. Postal Inspection Service for 12 years and served on the Dangerous Mail Investigations Unit. Cody, thank you for joining us. Appreciate it, TJ. Uh, our agenda today, we will cover a few topics. We'll start with data and statistics on mail security to get a sense of the scope of that problem. We'll talk techniques to reduce the risk exposure to enterprise level organizations, uh, how we can identify existing vulnerabilities in mail security. We'll talk mail security in the workplace, including enterprise wide SOPs. And of course, we'll leave time for a Q&A at the end of the session. Before we dive in, a quick introduction to who we are. If you're not familiar with Race Secure, we are world leaders in mail security, experts in mail threat detection and real-time analysis and support. So without further ado, what I'd like to do is bring in Will, our chief security officer, to take us through an introduction here to talk mail threat data sources and statistics. Take it away, Will. Thanks, TJ. So mail's an interesting topic. Uh, there's not really all that much reporting on it. Uh, what is reported out there generally has a lag on it for a decent period of time. So if you look at any reports for USPIS or you're looking at what the ATF or the Bomb Data Center is saying, usually what you're going to get for open source is going to be it's going to be annual, generally four to six months beyond that that calendar year. And uh, it it's going to be something that's useful, but that's not necessarily something that tells the entire story. So what we kind of did was start trying to track mail threats that come across um, our clients, and obviously we don't say who's who, but uh, come across our clients, anything that's reported in open source. So we get real-time threat tracking, and it gives us a, a more in-depth annual report, and it makes it more useful for people who are looking to try to figure out how to defend against upcoming threats. And throughout the year, the trends that, that do change and, and update, we, we can readdress those with people as need be, and we try to, we try to uh, make sure that everybody understands what's going on. With that, we've done is we did a 2021 annual report. That's where a good chunk of these numbers come from. Uh, we'll throw some updated stats as we go through for what's happened so far in 2022, which is actually speeding up compared to last year. So what we have saw numbers wise uh, now is going to be probably a good third, at least if it stays on track for what we're seeing in 2022. Uh, it does try to give actual and timely intelligence. We try to make sure that what you do is actually driven by some act or function so that it's not just doing something to, to do effort. The biggest thing we try to make sure we're doing is giving information and intelligence so decision makers can make a, a, an informed decision to better protect their organization and the people within it. So, so let's look will at we, uh, we have the report here. Can we take us through some of the recent stats from that 2021 number? I know we're gonna talk 2022 as well, but what are some of the big things we see from that report from last year? Yeah, so that's, what we're going we're gonna to hit is basically what happened 2021, like I mentioned, and we'll roll in 2022. The, the big things that come up in the threat types that we're discussing, uh, letters versus parcels, and we'll talk about the, the difference between the two of them. Uh, logistical shipments, those are changing as, as companies open back it up. So functions that haven't happened in you know several years are beginning again, and you have to get used to what you used to do beforehand. And uh, what's gone up, the contrabands, weapons, all that stuff. So what we're going to talk about is, is stats, but this is the, the threat types that we're going to cover uh, in some of these stats. So delivery methods, this also adjusts how the numbers come in. Most of what we're seeing now uh, is small USPS, less than half an inch thick, weighs less than 10 ounces. Uh, but we're also seeing in the new world we live in things like last mile threats, where if you, for example, order something through Amazon, what shows up, isn't in an Amazon truck at your front door or at your back dock if you're at the office. It's somebody in a personally owned vehicle, walk it up, throwing it on the porch or walk it up to the back dock and handing it off to somebody, taking a picture and, and leaving. So it's a great place to inject threats and it's a great place for somebody to, to cause problems in your organization. Uh, we've seen a couple increases in our office mail where it's been used to cause problems and send, send uh, illicit items or contraband from one facility to another. People assume that because it's already inside of your facility, it's inside of your your uh, logistical footprint that it's safe, and it's obviously not necessarily a true statement. So a lot of the stuff that's been going on is evolving, and it's evolving in ways that we really haven't looked at before. 
So we're used to just seeing the USPS, you know, mail get delivered. Well, now it's showing up with other companies and there's uh, companies are moving from not just necessarily themselves, but you'll see a USPS uh, delivery come in and then right behind it, you'll see a FedEx with a, a UPS being delivered because they're cross loading uh, parcels and equipment. So it's, it's a different uh, scenario that we've seen before, especially with all the, the worker loss. So in 2021, uh, if you look at the breakdown of the, how threats showed up and what they look like, we saw 33% were parcels. So that's things that are small that can be shipped. You can drop it off at USPS and it'll be delivered. Packages are larger. We broke those down in size. Um, and it's something that you can't necessarily get inside a collection bin. The interesting number is that the 56% of letters that showed up, that number went up from last year. It's not necessarily a screamingly high number, but what it does show is that the threats they're showing up are getting smaller and they're getting to be hopefully more anonymous for the people that are shipping them. What's been targeted? Uh, the numbers shifted a little bit in 2021. So federal government went up. Uh, in particular, you saw a lot of federal judges and lawyers that were being targeted at courthouses. Uh, residents went down, which makes sense because 2020, a lot of people were more people working at the house, but that number itself went uh, dove a little bit. Courts and corrections increased significantly, and so did the religion events, so primarily targeted it through the South. But um, it's it's interesting to watch what happens as we open back up, and you can see where people go, and then that's where the, uh, the eventual threats end up. So here's some changes over years. Like I said, uh, we broke down some of the, the, like I said, the federal government went down here from 17 to 12. That's because last year we collectively put all the, the the government together. Residents fell, religious increased, um, education increased a lot. Uh, if you looked at what's going on in the last probably two months with HBCUs or historically black college or universities, they've all been receiving bomb threats in really high numbers. And they've also been receiving threats that, that show up in other manners. But education, as people return back to school, there's a lot of white powder threats that have been getting delivered. And it's across the, the board. It's everything from elementary schools with upset people that that are uh, not happy with the PTO or all the way down to the colleges and, and higher level education. Uh, who's responding? This we talk about because it's kind of important we talk about SOPs later. This is a good identification of what type of threat you're actually looking at. So you look at the amount of times hazmat showed up versus the amount of times that the fire or police showed up. It's a good probability that you're gonna see a hazmat team higher than most everybody else. Uh, bomb squad went up this year. People saw more suspect packages that they thought were devices. Uh, there were not as many devices. Most of them end up being false positives or uh, hoaxes. But the numbers do kind of tell what you should be prepping for. So threat types, 56% um, of the time it was a letter threat, like we mentioned. Uh, drugs has gone up significantly. We have seen everything from the prisons that we're, we're beginning to work with down to corporations that are having to relook how they handle drug threats as it goes through either inner office mail or goes through their, their normal mail stream. If it was, you know, one time a year, three years ago, and now it's, you know, nine or 10, you have to look at your policies to figure out what you want to handle or how you want to handle it. And a lot of that time is being relooked. But it's, uh, it's telling when you look at what people think that they were looking at on the right. So obviously we didn't have a lot of ricin attacks or anthrax attacks last year, but that's what people thought when they did the initial report. That's what they, the initial response was. Generally, it ends up being something a bit more uh, benign. I mean, almost always something a bit more benign. But uh, the numbers of drugs is increasing that people think it is. So everybody 10, 15 years ago, you show a white powder threat, they're going to go, hey, that's anthrax. I got to worry about that. Now they're going, hey, that could be fentanyl or ISO, which is another one that's coming out. But they, they're perceiving that the threat is more drug related than what they're actually ending up looking at. So what's actually in there? Again, a lot of drugs. 28% uh, of the time when threats went out, it was white powder. Uh, we broke out drugs and powder. So inside that 26% of drugs is fentanyl. It's uh, cocaine and other you know, methamphetamines, other, other things that were sent out. That's actually what was in it. And the rest of that 28%, those are people sending in white powder threats. So that number is obviously higher than most everything else. Um, but it's, it's telling about what's going to most likely come at your organization. Uh, 25% threat letters, there is a large increase that we saw this year in people writing out their anger and sending it into organizations. Uh, part of the escalization process of you know, workplace violence, if you look at it and go, 
I send a tweet, nobody responds. I send an email, nobody responds. Now I'm going to send in a physical threat. And that's what breaks down that letter threat and the powder that gets sent into organizations. It's people increasing their frustration, and their anger levels. Uh, internationally, we started tracking that in 2021, and I think we're going to have an international report in 2022 because a lot of our clients have uh, worldwide footprints, and you've got to worry about everywhere that you, you put your people. So if you look at where we broke down for, for region, Asia and Europe had the majority of it. Uh, Asia was a lot of stuff going on in Hong Kong. And again, we have a lot of clients with, with facilities there. Uh, Europe has historically been three times higher to have a terrorist event than the United States or North America. And what um, what we've seen is that it shows true in, in letters and holds true in, in mail threats as well. They just have closer borders and higher frustration levels, and it's a common way for people to reach out. Uh, targets, as you'd expect, a lot of government uh, and a lot of residents, but it, it generally looks along the same lines. Here's the United States, and then, again, powder threats are just as prevalent overseas as they are here in the United States. One thing that we did look at through the year was if you see an event that happens through, you know, social media driven or whatever goes on inside the society, there is a reaction that follows it based on how people feel and what they what they do. So January 6th is a great example. Uh, the event that happened, I'm not going to get into politics or policy of it, but it happened. The people that were involved were from all over the United States. So when those charges come down and they're federal, you can't really get into federal courts or federal uh, office spaces very easily. So you can send in a letter, a white powder threat. And right behind it, we saw a huge jump in events, and it was generally aimed at courts and corrections. And then if you go through the year, and I don't need to go through all of them, we saw it, we all lived through it. But those events that we see on the news, they drive reactions, obviously, in the workplace that we worry about, you know, going in the front door. But it drives reactions where people have a, a, a response within your logistical footprint. <clears throat> Yeah, so thank you, Will, for, for taking us through the stats. I want to remind everybody that the slides are available uh, for you to download. We're going through these statistics fairly quickly, so please feel free to download those and review later. Uh, also, a quick reminder that uh, the Q&A box is open. would love to have your questions on it, this or any of the other material we're going to discuss today. Uh, so, Will, thanks again for taking us through the stats. Can we talk about, you know, now that we know how prevalent the problem is, what can organizations be doing about it to prevent and reduce some risk? Absolutely. So there's a there's a few things that we're we're kind of looking at on the horizon and seeing what we what we're gonna have to deal with next one of the things we've been looking at and have been seeing a significant amount of of chatter about is the convergence of physical and cyber threats so last week in ireland there were sim cards and chips that were mailed in surreptitiously into organization they're trying to get people to to input them we've always seen that phishing schemes th those are common we've all stopped giving out usb keys as uh as gimmies when people you know come by the booth or whatever it's not something we'd all do but they're looking for new ways of doing that. One of the ways that popped out uh, two years ago that we've been looking to recently is, is worshiping. It's putting a device inside of a package and mailing it into an organization that turns on when it gets there and then just sits and listens and collects information. All the, the requirements for learning how to do this can be done on YouTube. The components cost less than $200 by the time you get it done and all the software can be downloaded on the internet. Um, we run one here in the office We and it's, literally cost $200. We can monitor everything in here. It's only one or two more steps before that is hacking inside of your organization. So we don't need to talk about how you can do it. You can get YouTube and, and look for it on your own. But the reality is there's a lot of organizations that receive returned packages, return things from their clients or from their customers. They could very easily hide one of these and it just gets inside and say you just market to the company and there's no person. It gets a return to sender in three weeks. Well, that three weeks that it's been sitting there, it's been paying attention to your network, watching handshakes, watching logins, and capturing information. And then when the organization returns it to sender, you end up with all your data now outside of the company footprint and in somebody else's hands. Uh, it's another way that you can look at corporate espionage, uh, hacking. You can do all sorts of stuff with it. It's a tiny little computer that will execute whatever you tell it to. Uh, and it can get within your walls. And it can sit up next to your servers and cause problems. So it, it's something to look at. And if you're screening, it's definitely something that should be paid attention to if you're looking to, to secure your, your organization. So this is a good example of what traditional ones look like when somebody hands off a USB key or drops them. Uh, we, I mean, at the time of the military, we had them show up outside of gates all the time. 
people would leave them you know overseas and expect you to go plug them into your computer uh, but it's another method that will do the same amount of damage just without having to physically touch your organization or touch your computer with the amount of things that we have connected via wi-fi and have access to our networks nowadays uh, we've all heard about when the printers were attacked or when somebody would go after the copier uh, because it didn't necessarily have all the patches or updates that's what these look for is things that aren't updated so uh, emerging threat trends that, that came up in the last year when we talked about the white powder threats we did see was increased toxicity in these events so that's not just people you know sending in fentanyl versus cocaine that's increased toxicity and i think cody will bring up a, an event here in a second but what it comes to is when it was two three years ago sending milled in white powder it was flour it was most of the time it was benign but what we're seeing now is an increase where people put in caustic soda putting in uh, powdered bleach where they're intending to cause harm to the individual on the other end of the mail stream. Uh, drugs, we'll hit those in a little bit again. Some of the things that drove folks, social intolerance, is, it was one last year, we looked at all those threat letters that came up. A lot of those were driven by people who were intolerant of the change and seeing what's going on. Uh, a lot more individuals are being targeted. So your CEO is really hard to hide. So it's, you know, you're angry with the company or the corporation. Yes, they do go after the company, but uh, more often now they're going after the individuals in charge by name and usually outside of their, their normal uh, security parameters. And then the convergence of cyber and, and physical. So, uh, Cody, we were talking about the fentanyl a little bit ago. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Uh, even with the image here on this slide, um, I saw yesterday, I believe, uh, DEA recently sent out and I believe they sent it out yesterday to all their uh, local, state, and federal partners, a memorandum basically saying, hey, we, we are expecting a, a large increase in overdose events related to fentanyl, mass overdose events. So we're talking three or more people. Um, that has been a trend last year, but the information that they're gathering just based on the increase in fentanyl numbers across the board, I think that we've been seeing that even from the information that we track, uh, it's a trend that's it's definitely increasing exponentially. And I would say as well, you know, we, it's shifted a little. Fentanyl has primarily come into the country via the uh, mail, right? Because that's a lot of that was coming from China, et cetera. We were looking like 80% or something the first few years. Some of that has shifted as, as some has started coming in from Mexico, but it is lower grade. So the primary source of it is still coming in via the mail stream just due to the quality of it. So I don't think that those numbers are necessarily going to decrease. And it's obviously uh, the feds already have that on the radar for this year as a, as a major problem. So it's something that we should expect to see or continue to see increasing. Absolutely. So we've got some, uh, we've done a lot of work recently with correctional facilities and this is primarily driven at them, but everything from paper that's been doused or, or laced and they put it in as legal documentation. They will uh, basically put it down, say that this person sending it to me is my lawyer and therefore it's protected. And it gets inside the organization. And with that overdoses, you have a, increases the, the black market the crime rate, or not crime rate, the, the violence rate goes up inside of prisons and facilities. Um, we, we bring this up because we have people on here that, that are from the uh, correction side, uh, but it's something that you're gonna see in the, in the future. And it causes one of the, uh, one of the news when people get hit. We had uh, an event that two weeks ago in Ohio at a children's or a, a juvenile detention facility where the fentanyl got up in the HVAC system. Uh, five of the seven people that were, were hurt were directly uh, inhalation, poisoning from it. And the two first responders and the correctional facility individuals are trying to take care of them and give them aid ended up getting overdosed simply by being around it. Um, we talked about individuals being targeted, uh, political Threats have gone up. Last year, Dr. Fauci, uh, Senator Rand Paul, Representative Omar, uh, a, a huge amount of government entities were targeted with white powder threats that went after them. Uh, the interesting thing there is all that mail was screened. It was all run through a screening facility, and it was all still delivered, and it was dropped off, and it still caused exposure. And then uh, I mentioned the religious stuff a little bit ago, but those numbers are, are increasing as well, primarily throughout the southern states and primarily at churches. But uh, individual leaders are targets, and if they're part of your organization or part of your community, it's something for you to take a look at as well. Um, Anti-vaccine sentiment, this is waning a little bit, but it's not waning necessarily when it comes to people setting threats in because of it. 
Uh, it's just the, the group of people that are tending to do this are still quite upset about it. Policies were looking you know, several months ago where they were going to fire anybody that wasn't vaccinated. Those policies have changed for some organization. They've relaxed a little bit. But it's still something to, to keep an eye on. And it's still something in your organization to pay attention to is what's your stance and what's the expectation of a response or retaliation for the folks who might be affected by it. Um, we hit this really quickly because bombs don't tick anymore. If you think about it, uh, everything that you need to do, you can do with your cell phone. And with that, you don't need to do anything other than get a cheap phone, uh, put some commands in it, drop a couple, you know, couple software programs on it, and it will do whatever you need it to do and whatever you want it to do. With that, screening policies really should change and start looking for, for you know, that type of, of threat. Small um, things that are identifiable as components, but don't necessarily identify themselves as what they do. So like that Raspberry Pi we showed you a little bit ago, that looks like a small computer, it doesn't, but it doesn't have to. It look like anything. Um, so it's not necessarily going to be an IED when you look at events like this, but it can be just about anything that, that they want it to be. Uh, threat reduction. Cody, did you want to hit this one? Yeah, I just think kind of the, the main thing is, um, you know, utilizing the right tool for the job. And we get a lot of uh, questions about overt versus covert type programs. And and that's really um, that's really user specific. But, you know, my my experience has shown that overt programs do work, especially when you are dealing with um, a case where a lot of your threats or some of your threats are internal from, you know, insider insiders. And I, I think that just them knowing that there's an active program going on, that people are looking at stuff, can prevent a lot of that. I mean, we've, I worked with a client even recently in the past few weeks where the overwhelming majority of their, their threats are uh, through interoffice mail. And that is something that if, if your folks know that we're actively checking this stuff out, we're actively looking at it, we have the right tools for the job, it tends to suppress a lot of that. So uh, I think that's one thing that we need to, to be more adamant about uh, moving through that throughout the year. Absolutely. So perhaps to uh, to take us a little deeper into that, Cody, if you could take us through, you know, identifying and assessing existing security vulnerabilities. I'm going to assume that a lot of organizations might have a bit of a blind spot here. I know we refer to this as the last gap in physical security. Uh, so perhaps you could take us through with uh, an eye on the clock. I want to respect folks' time here. Uh, but can you take us through what that might look like and how to identify those gaps? Yeah, you know, that is kind of a, a blind spot for some folks. It's either overlooked or, you know, people don't have a lot of familiarity with it. So it's it tends to get some attention, but they, you know, they, they, they're doing the best they can with what they have. So uh, as a result of that, a lot of times people go straight to the bomb squad or hazmat as a first response to a lot of these incidents. And it really it, what it does is it causes an outcome that's not desirable in most situations. Um, when we're looking at the type of threats that we're receiving, um, most often, they don't require that type of response. So your training and, and the tools that you have and your familiarity with the process and having contacts outside your organization really helps to minimize that impact. So you're you're getting the response that you need for what you're dealing with at that time. So uh, that's one of the things that we've been trying to focus on with folks. And I think it's good to have that perspective uh, in terms of your program uh, moving forward. So when we're talking about uh, front door, back door, we talk about this all the time, right? It's physical goods entering the building, and that's often something that's overlooked a lot. Um, we check stuff coming in. We x-ray. We use technology. We, we wand people to make sure they don't have any sort of contraband on them. We do all these things, and then truck after truck shows up on the back dock and unloads letters and parcels and large packages and bulk stuff, and it comes right into the facility, and it gets dispersed throughout the organization uh, with little oversight. So... Um, Really, that's the gap that you mentioned earlier. And what we're trying to fill is uh, adding a, the correct security posture to address those types of threats and those conveyances so we can mitigate those threats as they're coming in. And, and this is not a uh, individual. This is a, a, a problem across the board, regardless of sector. It's just something that hasn't been addressed traditionally to the level it needs to. And that's that's what we're, our focus has been on uh, moving forward. So. The a risk assessment, so you mentioned something earlier talking about um, the transition into this, this portion of the, the presentation. And I would say that inaccurate risk assessments um, is a big problem that we see because people are using those to craft responses in security programs. 
And if you have that inaccurate information, obviously you're not getting the solution that you need to, to address that. So what we what we work with a lot of times on folks is getting an accurate picture of what your threats are and what your, what your vulnerabilities are. And that does a number of things. It really helps us identify threats that they may be facing, whether that's people or infrastructure. Um, it helps us identify any vulnerabilities that, have, that are overlooked. And a lot of times those come out during this process. Um, when we do that, it gives us a list of priorities that we need to address. And then subsequent, I guess you would, you would say that it identifies who has the responsibility over each one of those priorities. So then we can figure out where to spend budget and all that kind of stuff. And really it just ties the whole program together, but it starts with getting an accurate risk assessment and that's, that's that's kind of the foundation for moving forward with all of these other things that are critical. But if you mess up that first piece, then the whole uh, the whole chain is messed up. So uh, we spend a lot of time getting that right. And once we do, we feel like we can put something together uh, that really works for for the end user. So looking at your organization as a living entity, um, really all we're saying here is is that as threats change organizations need to be positioned to quickly respond and react. So they need to be able to adapt. They need to be able to evolve the situations. Uh, Will mentioned earlier, you know, if, if someone, a prominent individual within your organization makes some controversial statements or they take a stance that's polarizing, um, that can often be seen as the organization's stance or posture towards something, right? It's all seen the same. So whether that individual is being attacked, say, someone responds negative negatively to that they mail in a hoax powder and it arrives on the ceo's desk not only does it affect that person in an adverse way but there's also a downstream effect within the organization because now you may have to deal with evacuations you may have to deal with uh, decontamination if it's a if it's a scenario where they can't identify what the substance is so out of an abundance of caution they're going to decon people you know there's all of these things that that happen so um as you know, if, if somebody comes out and makes a statement on the news or uh, during an interview, we need to be able to respond to that as a living entity and, and do it quickly just to make sure that we're ahead of the curve when these things when these things show up. Absolutely. So regarding the, the, you know, secure the workplace, especially Will, as you mentioned, bring, you know, bringing folks back in, we have hybrid and remote. We all know how everybody kind of went home and started working there for, for quite some time in 2020. As that trend shifts, you know, as things change a little bit, how does that change the landscape of risk assessment uh, for SOPs and for workplace security? Yeah, so we're all, we're all aware of what ESRM is and we're all aware of, of the implementation process and all the things that we do with it. But the, the really thing that we see with this, where it comes down to is it, you, this usually sits in a gap or a seam inside of an organization. So mail is a logistical function. Yes, it, facilities owns it in company A. Security might own it, although rarely do we see that. Usually it's facilities or a third party vendor who comes in and takes care of it. Um, and the, really, the reality comes down to ownership. Now, when you put a hybrid mode, you have people that are there two days of the week or three days of the week or their desk rotates or whatever else. It really adds a bunch of chaos into the equation of trying to identify something that's physically gonna come into the organization, how to make sure that it's identified, screened, and then handled appropriately. Uh, if those people are working in a hybrid mode, some stuff might come in and sit for several days before they even have a chance to identify that they're not the, the right recipient for it. So we, we're not gonna go through the deep you know, dredgers of this, but the reality is it's something to think about and it's really something you need to apply to the new process. Uh, the SOPs, and we'll hit those in a second, are probably need to be reassessed and relooked based on what we look like now, if that makes sense. So management is how we're how this is actually going to be assisted, right? So management has to buy into this, is to empower people that are going to be there working those five days a week inside the mailroom, uh, but everybody else is around them is only two or three. So they need to be given the ability to affect change and to make decisions so that if something does come in or something is questionable, they can react to it effectively. Um, this is a quick graph, but the reality is, is it's evolving and changing. We see this in all of our clients. We see this when we talk to, to people just in general about security is it's not what it looked like two years ago. And you need to be malleable and start making some of those adjustments with what you've been doing and making sure that the individuals involved are, like I said, empowered and able to affect change and, and make an improvement. Mm -hmm. So, Cody, can you take us through how folks might reevaluate those SOPs as Will uh, you know, is suggesting here? 
Um, you know, you, you handle a lot of this with you and your team uh, with what Race Secure does. So what are some of the things you're seeing and how can folks, you know, kind of update their SOPs moving forward? Yeah, I think uh, we hit on one earlier, and that's doing accurate risk assessments. And, you know, our organizations spend a lot of time and resources, and they're very good at, at doing a physical risk assessment. And sometimes that has a male component. Oftentimes when I'm talking to clients, they, they've it doesn't include that necessarily. They may hit on just a few things, but it doesn't go in depth. So uh, having that accurate assessment of what you're looking at uh, is critical starting off the process. Um, Will mentioned earlier about being able to adapt uh, and, and empowering people. I think part of that is once we see threats and we're evolving, we talk about that that living organizi uh, organization, um, we need to have solutions that are realistic, number one, but they have to be repeatable, uh, but not to the sense where we're, we're, we're stuck with those. And that's all we look at is this process. We go through steps one through 12 and we're done. If something changes and we need to adapt to it, we need to do that um, in real time. Uh, Will mentioned earlier, a lot of the threat data that comes out uh, from federal organizations is maybe 12 to 18 months behind what's actually occurring. So if you're relying on that as your only source of information, you're a year and a half behind a proper response. So being active and looking at new and emerging trends, keeping up with uh, information that is, you know, kind of highlighting some of the stuff that people are seeing related to mail security is critical in this. And I think what it does is it, it allows you to evolve at a much faster pace to respond to the things that you need to. Um, when we're looking at the threats that we face, uh, and then we compare that to the vulnerabilities that hopefully we've identified through some of these risk assessments. It gives us a real good idea of where we need to prioritize our security response. And that's what kind of relates to the things that you're seeing on, on the slide here. Um, specifically, what we're talking about is people, infrastructure, and assets. When we can start addressing these properly and dialing in our response based on maybe motives or specific threats that we're seeing, then we really start to fine tune these programs in a way that allows us to, again, I keep harping on this, but we need to be, we need to be fast in how we respond, but it has to be an accurate response. Otherwise we're just wasting resources and, and uh, budget uh, in those efforts. Absolutely. So, uh, we mentioned this a little bit ago, but the reality is most of the time it's going to be something small. It's going to be less than half an inch thick, less than 10 ounces. There's a couple reasons for that, but it's what USPS or like to put stamps on primarily. Uh, but this is what's showing up. It's not, you know, somebody with a, with a gigantic box that they put this all this thread in. It's something primarily that will be hand delivered, can slide on a desk, and will hope they think get through whatever screening process you have in place. So just to reiterate that one. And uh, to Cody's point, implementing realistic and repeatable, that, that's critical. Realistic, repeatable, uh, something you, that's not going to tax, but yet you also have to do it to where it's going to involve enough people so you, you exercise the effort, not just the three people that might possibly be involved. Uh, if something happens, those three people are most likely, you know, in the mailroom or going to be exposed, and they are no longer players. They are now being handled and segregated and decontaminated, but all the other steps still have to happen. Uh, with that, that means SOPs, emergency response plans, training, all, all that needs to be done, but done intelligently and done to the, to the level where you, you don't just go, yeah, it's the mailroom. That happens a lot. And when you end up seeing is major corporations who have plans and policies in place end up evacuated for six, seven hours at a time because they didn't necessarily plan for a smaller event or didn't necessarily plan for the all the possible outcomes. So what's actually in it? Uh, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but we'll go back to it for two reasons. Uh, one, three of these things equal 75% of the threats. Three of them fit that profile we were talking about being quite small. And those three are also the most likely to be what shows up because people get angry or people want to move something that's illicit. One of the two, one of those three, or two of those three is going to cause problems. Um, I would take this slide back with you to your organization and take a look at it. And then look at your SOPs and identify, hey, are these, do we appropriately align our SOP requirements based on what's most likely to end up in front of us? Hey, well, I'll just, I'll add real quick just on that slide. It's interesting because yep. if you look at that 25% that are threatening letters, um, if we're not staying on top of those and addressing them appropriately, those can all, usually or sometimes end up being 
that powder event. So that 25% leads into that 28%, which is the, the threatening powder that shows up on the CEO's desk or, or, or whatnot, because they don't get the response they want, right? So just something to think about as we're looking at these numbers. Those two are often, they often piggyback one another. Yeah, that goes to the escalation process. You know, it's yeah. tweet, nothing, email, nothing. All right, well, I'm going to send you how much I hate you. Next thing I'm going to send you is something that will cause a hazmat response. Great, Cody, thank you. Cody, this one's you. Okay, uh, the screening gap. We hit the highlights on the conveyance. I think it was 56, 57% of the time being a small letter. With that small letter, we're usually talking about small amounts of powders. And, you know, historically, there has been that gap that we're talking about here that doesn't allow us to address those appropriately. And as we see an increase in those numbers, we have to adjust to that. And that's often involves a kind of an overhaul of our program and the tools that we're using. Absolutely. Um, again, you know, when we look at guidelines that are put out by governments and, you know, the amount of effort that goes into crafting those and they can often be behind. But, you know, um, looking at the trends, looking at the threats and even looking at some what we would call outdated guidelines, even back then, they were talking about, hey, these things can be undetectable by some of these typical solutions that we're used to. So. Um, we're slow to respond a lot of times, and that's just the nature of security, law enforcement, federal government, whatever the case may be. That's just how the wheels turn. So we're trying to be proactive about educating people on, hey, here's, here's what we're actually seeing through your threat data center, and how can you, we help you uh, get positioned in a way that allows you to respond to these things quickly? Because the reality of it is they're causing just as much damage as a, as a uh, real event, these hoaxes. Um, and you know, we're talking resources, time, mental effects of people having to deal with this because they don't know what the substance is initially. So there can be some lingering effects there, et cetera. So we really want to try to stay out ahead of these and, uh, and address them as as they start to change. Let me throw one more thing in here. So what we've seen a lot of organizations when we go into them is they'll take the USPS collection bin, we'll have a couple hundred letters or whatever in it, and they toss it in the x-ray machine. That's not doing anything for most of the threats that are going to come through. Uh, even if it, it does land in there perfectly and you do get a view of it, we're looking at things that just don't have enough mass to actually get a decent image on the other end for the x-ray to, to tell you what it is. So it really does go look at your process and go look at how people screen and what goes on in, in the logistical side. Um, we've been in several in, in organizations in the last you know month, month and a half, and that's just the standard. It goes in there, and then people aren't even looking at the screen. So, and then they're calling it screen and good. So their tools are being out there. They are, they will give you answers. They will help help you, but make sure you use them A, properly. And B, you're setting the screener up for success with procedures on how they handle it. Yeah, and when you're looking at those tools and solutions, I think it's important to remember, especially if you've got a large footprint, you know, if you have a, if you have a global footprint, for instance, um, you, do need a, you do need a solution that works across your organization. That doesn't mean that, every physical spot has the exact same equipment and tools and, and training. It may look like that, but it may uh, look something totally different. If you have a small satellite office with just a handful of people, what they have and what they do is gonna look totally different than your headquarters. However, they do need to be speaking, they need to speak the same language and they do need to address the five pillars that we talk about, which is you know the people, the SOPs, training, technology, emergency response, all of those pillars need to be addressed regardless of location size. It's just that the, the tools and the solution may look a little bit different. However, they need to integrate and they need to speak the same language in order for it to work effectively for your whole, for your whole organization. And one of the big things on this one that we've, we find with many, many of our clients is, is the key part of this is people. It's the, the person that makes sure that they know what the SOP is, obviously the training and, and everything that happens inside that, but getting buy-in having people really believe in what they're doing and, and know the reason for doing it. Uh, it just, I mean, it seems kind of kind of ridiculous to have to say that, but a lot of times people forget that there's a person doing this task and whatever you're asking them to do needs to be, you know, something that's not overwhelming or, or demeaning. Yeah. And I would, I would just say kind of uh, wrapping that up is that, you know, we mentioned it earlier, that process has to be cyclical. We always have to be looking at the threats, uh, assessing what's going on, looking at the solutions that we have, uh, 
you know, validating that. Is it actually working and doing what we need it to do? What are the new and emerging things that are popping up? How are we responding to those? And that's a continuous process that we have to be looking at um, constantly. And, you know, as you like to say, well, reality gets a vote. What we think is happening um, and what does that look like compared to what's actually happening? So uh, we can't allow emotions to get in the way and being you know, committed to a process or something that we've been doing for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Reality gets a vote. We need to keep that in mind. We need to have the information that's out there and it's available to us to respond to those types of things. And that information allows us to make those adjustments as we're moving forward. So uh, there's no shame in, in changing things up. That's actually that's actually a good sign if we're if we're doing it based on good information. Absolutely. We, it's, it's interesting to go into an organization and see that, you know, we put this program in place 15 years ago. But since then, we've hired 2000 employees. Uh, since yeah. then, we moved from facility A to facility B, and all they did was pick up the, the, the equipment and move it to facility B, and it, it doesn't work anymore. So, it, unfortunately, uh, reality, it, it does get a vote, and uh, it's just something that we all need to, to, to keep in mind when we, <laughs> when we try to solve these problems. So, gentlemen, thanks very much for all the analysis so far. I want to remind everybody that we do have uh, quite a bit more information available. Uh, here are some additional resources that Race Secure puts out. Uh, to help inform these smart decisions, as Will mentioned earlier. Uh, and also a reminder that the Q&A box is wide open. We'd love to have a few of your questions to go through. Uh, we do have a few that have come in already, so thank you for those that have submitted those questions. Uh, but gentlemen, before we move on to the Q&A portion, is there anything else uh, that we you know should cover real fast, or do we dive into Q&A here? Uh, the, big thing that I think, good. the big thing that I think we need to, to you need focus on with this, and I'm sure Cody will have a quick one, is this is not something that anybody really pays all that much attention to, or, or they don't put don't seem to put that much effort into a lot of times. Not because they don't want to, but because it's prioritized much lower than all the other really important, critical things that you've got to do during the day. Um, this isn't something maybe you need to touch every day, but it's something if you touch on a regular basis, uh, it, it will help improve the security of the organization. Um, it's it's something that people uh, it's low priority, but it can be a high painful process that you have to deal with a high pain point if it's something that you you ignore too long that that's really the the one takeaway that i would have to that you know it, it becomes a priority for a lot of folks when something happens and then it's it's kind of too late at that point they're playing catch up or they're doing damage control whether we're talking about you know uh, injuries or or you know something horrible like that or just brand and and you know reputation um so get out ahead of it and if you don't know where to go you know reach out and and find the resources you need to to start moving that those programs forward mm -hmm. i think we had one example given recently on a similar event uh where somebody said they had a, a three-hour shutdown at their company from a mail security incident and it ended up costing the company several hundred thousand dollars just for those three hours of, uh, of productivity lost and other you know related uh, problems so certainly something to get out in front of Excellent. Thank you. So we'll go through some of the questions that have been submitted already. Again, we look forward to having more of these. Please do submit those now. They always make for a better discussion toward the end of these events. Uh, there's a question listed here, gentlemen, that I'll throw it out to you. Uh, Will, I'm going to start with you on this one. It says, thoughts on the use of itemizers for mail screening rooms for things like explosives, narcotics. Uh, what are the pros and cons for maintenance, calibration, all the rest? Uh, and can you maybe start with, if, if folks aren't familiar, what is an itemizer? What does it do? How does it differ from other technologies out there? And, and give us your, you know, your opinion on that. So itemizers are great tools. They, they absolutely are something that you can use effectively to identify exactly what you're looking at. They will give you the chemical breakdown and composition of whatever you're, whatever's been on a package, whatever's been inside of explosive. They're, they're very good. Uh, so when you go to the airport and they swipe your bag with the stick and the little white patch, that's what they're using. That tool is generally an item, itemizer. Um, pros and cons. Pros, they will tell you what you're looking at. If the library has it, it'll give you a good answer. Um, the, the cons, you're going to get a lot of false positives. Uh, if I, for example, have a cousin that has a, a farm and I go to that farm over their weekend and then I come in the office and grab something to move it, you swipe that, you're, you're going to get fertilizer. And then you don't know the reasoning behind why I have fertilizer on me, but it's something that looks suspect. Uh, they do cost a little bit more. They do cost uh, a little bit in, in expendables, but they'll give you a quick identification of what you're looking at and, and what's inside generally because it transfers to the outside. Um, I would say they're fantastic, uh, but I do say they also have a lot of false positives. When you put them in a mail environment, and we put them with somebody who people are generally not security minded. Uh, if you ever had anything swipe on the airport TSA, they're gonna swipe your bag, and then they're gonna get three different levels of, 
of uh, managers to come down for one of them to go, yeah, yeah, it's okay. It, it just happens all the time. So there's a question here about, uh, you know, I guess comparing not necessarily itemizers, but uh, in terms of X-ray or bio detection systems where those two might overlap or be different. Uh, if X-ray has this, uh, you know, this gap that we've talked about, finding small amounts of powders and liquids and that sort of thing, uh, you know, does the USPS have any similar technology? What are they doing? Uh, you know, what kind of sense of security can we all take from that? Uh, and Cody, I'm going to go to you on this one as your time with the USPIS. Uh, what can you tell us about their screening via X-ray or other biodetection systems or things like that? Yeah, so um, what I would say, so they do have a biological detection system, BDS programs that, that um, they have at certain processing facilities. Um, there's a couple things that, to keep in mind on those, and uh, they're great at what they do, which is looking for a specific type of biological, which is anthrax, right? So there's other things that, that are that are threats that no, won't necessarily be addressed with that equipment, number one. And then they also, uh, not to get into the specifics of it, but they they do not address every sort of mail conveyance that comes through uh, the postal service. That's just physically impossible, uh, just due to size and, and, and weight restrictions and things like that. So um, I would say that's the two things that I would focus on is that they do not screen every type of biological. It's very, it's very specific what they're looking for, and it does not cover all types of letter flat package parcel however you want to look at it, it doesn't uh, cover every conveyance so um, while it does one thing really well um, it, there's there are some gaps in that system so that falls on the end user and I always tell people this nobody cares about your safety more than you do so as much as the postal service is putting time and effort into it it's up to you to handle that on your end so you have to fill in that gap uh, oftentimes well said all right. So a question here about external offices or mail facilities uh, where a lot of you know organizations will kind of offsite their mail for receiving, screening, sorting, all that, and then have it delivered once it's cleared, then it can make its way into the, you know, the actual headquarters. Uh, so what can we say about that as a security strategy? Uh, is that, you know, pros and cons there as well? Plus also, if your organization may not have the resources to, you know, to have a whole separate facility, what might you be able to do, uh, you know, kind of in lieu of that, uh, that external strategy. So, Will, let's start with you on that. Uh, what can you tell us about these offsite facilities? First off, it's great. If you can, if you can do that, if your organization can take the, the, the amount of capital it's going to take to, to do it offsite out of the main facility and then dedicate a screening process, that's fantastic. Unfortunately, most cannot, and they do end up costing quite a bit of money. Um, and, it's, it's interesting to see the, the benefit of, of that program. Um, if you have a smaller office with four to five people in it per se, and, and you know, that, that's, you're not gonna do that for that event. But what we, you do see is that those four to five people might still be heavily targeted. They might still have problems. So you have to do some screening. Um, most of the solutions that you put in place are, can be fairly cheap, fairly and fairly effective. A little bit of training, hands-on, and everything from the the small office where it's, you know, dislocated from a large amount of, of logistical support, uh, all the way up to larger facilities where they do it offsite. Uh, just doing the doing the screening procedure in the first place is the best thing to do. That answer that one, Actually, Cody. Cody, any any uh, additional on that? No, I, he's spot on. They are they are they can be cost prohibitive for a lot of a lot of folks, or maybe they they don't physically have the real estate to, to handle that. So, um, and if you find kind of the middle ground where maybe you have a, a larger uh, setup where you do not have this external screening facility, you know, I, I would say kind of best practice there or, or something you can look at is finding a, a room or an area that is cl as close to an exterior loading dock or intake uh, uh, location as you can. And you just all mail gets centralized and sent to one spot and you consolidate your screening efforts in that one area, right? We always talk at the, about the mail transfer route. So when we talk about point of reception where it shows up at your organization to the to uh, that next stop, which would be where you're going to screen it, we wanna minimize that. We wanna uh, avoid any inadvertent exposure to people or, or property. So uh, handling that in that, that fashion can oftentimes uh, take care of it. If you can't do that, then you got to go into route planning and looking how to navigate that through your organization to keep things as safe as possible. So it's really particular. And that's why we always say, hey, there's there's no cookie cutter response to those SOPs. But once you get into the details of it, you can usually work out a solution that, that, that can work. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Uh, we have time for maybe two or three more here. There is a question about SOP, which I'll come back to in a minute, but there's a different topic here I'd like to, to bring up that we haven't talked about yet, and that is digitizing mail before it gets delivered. Uh, and I know this yep. is common in a lot of uh, correctional facilities uh, where you know somebody might get, uh, let's call it a, a personal letter. That letter gets scanned in and delivered on an iPad or on a computer screen, so there's no physical copy. I don't, you know, to what extent is that going to weed out uh, any, you know, mail thread? Somebody has to do the scanning, I imagine. So at what point can we call that a, uh, you know, an effective security solution? And, and uh, Will, again, we'll start with you here. Uh, what can you yeah. tell us about that digitization process? So let's let's look at at uh, the correction side real quick. Just for, for example, first off, the everybody who's working in that mailroom is still exposed to possible threats. So even if you do digitize, it doesn't get to the to the prisoner. It, it's still going to be exposed in somebody. Uh, it does work. Uh, it, however, there's legal questions about it. Uh, some states are suing. Some states are, are, are being sued. It depends on what you want to do. So it's, it's for them. It's trying to stop contraband. For corporations, it's it's a good it's a good uh, practice. The, the downside is there's still going to be stuff that has to get delivered. Uh, you can't digitize you know legal documentation. If you need signatures or you need this that, there's still going to be things that have to go through. So the process needs to be there. But the the actual process of changing everything to a digital is, is becoming more and more popular amongst the, the corporate America. Excellent. Uh, so let's bring it back into SOPs. Uh, the question here is how long does it take to uh, implement an SOP program? And are there groups that can help with that uh, if, you know, if an organization is not set up to do it themselves? Cody, in your work with putting together SOPs, how long have you seen this process take? Um, it, you know, best case scenario, you could do, you could do something in a couple of weeks. It'll give you a pretty, Pretty robust document if if the if all parties are engaged and the information is readily available that you need to to put this together. If you're talking about something where it's a large global uh, organization, numerous locations, sometimes that takes a little bit just to get all of the um, involved parties on board with the specifics and details of what you need, specifically for site requirements and things like that. So it varies a lot, but you can you can knock one out really quick. Um, we help clients do it all the time. Sometimes, you know, it, it may end up taking three or four weeks if we're talking about a major, you know, very complicated type solution. But still, I think that's pretty that's pretty quick uh, in the big scheme of things. Um, so, you, again, it depends, but you can kind of see where how that works out. Yeah, that's like and, uh, the tail end of this question is asking about groups to help. I know that's something that, that your our team does. We, Will and Cody can help with. Um, and so, well, I didn't mean to cut you off there. What was your addition? Uh, it, it's not three or four weeks of solid work. It's a couple hours here because a lot of questions get asked. You got to go back and do some do a research. So that's right. <laughs> it's yeah. it's sessions. Yeah. yeah, it's it's weeks of work for, ties us, into, but for uh, the end user. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not yeah. that much. So. So that ties into another question just came in. And uh, again, thank you for this question. This question asks about the difference between X-Ray and Ray Securus technology, which we call our mail secure in the T-Ray range. So, Will, can you just you know quickly answer uh, what the difference might be in those two types of screening technology? So X-Ray is ionizing. It's going to go through uh, a large amount of material. Like I said, most of the threats are small or whatever. What we're doing is the same thing at the airport. When you raise your hands over your head and they screen you real fast, it's a completely safe, a millimeter wave uh, system that looks inside of packages and you can put your hands in it, move things around and it allows you to interact while you're going through the screening process. So one is, one is, you know, ionizing and a little hazardous. The other one is safe and you plug it and put it in any office you need to put it. 